I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to the Unashamed Podcast. We don't have Zach with us again because he's busy doing Zach things. Um, he's a movie mogul now, so he's trying to make sure shepherd our movie through the theaters, which I do want to encourage you guys, you know, this first week that it's out to be sure and, uh, and check it out. Um, it probably will open the opportunity for another week if we get enough people to go this first week. So, uh, hearing good things, getting a lot of good reviews, dad, people, uh, talking about how much it's impacted them. I've been noticing that on social media this week. Uh, so I think it's having the uh, impact that we wanted it to have. Um, which is powerful. And, you know, it's interesting, Dad, because, you know, you put yourself out there and you tell, you know, the truth about some of your struggles, and it's not easy to do, but it impacts people in, in a big way. And so Lisa and I wrote our first book called A New Season back way back in 2015, which was eight years ago now. And in the book, we talked about struggles. We talked about her struggles. As a kid, we talked about, you know, how that led into some of our struggles as a married couple and some of the difficulties that we had. And because of that, we wrote the book and, it, and it's not it's not easy to write a book anyway. I mean, we've all three written books, um, multiple books. But when you're writing a book about your own life, it's not easy at all. But the reason we did it was because we want to have an opportunity for ministry. And so through the years, we've had different people that have read the book. It impacted them. It was right where they were in their life or their marriage. They hadn't become Christians yet. And recently there was a couple uh, that lives up in northern Alabama and they read our book and they were, had gone through a similar situations to us, unfaithfulness in their marriage. And they thought their marriage was over, but they read the book and they thought, well, maybe it's not over. You know, maybe there's something we can do. And so they began to apply some of the principles from our book into their relationship. And they wound up coming to an event that we did um, a couple of months back and we met them. And so we got a message from them this last week, Dad, you'll love this. And she said, you know, I realized that I really need to commit myself fully to Christ. And she felt like she hadn't done that. And that might be unlocking then the key to kind of what's been going on with their marriage and some of our other past problems. So they drove down here to Gulf Shores where we are and we arranged it and they want to get baptized in the Gulf. And so that's what we did yesterday. We sat down and we talked about, you know, the gospel and what that means, how that impacts, how that changes us. Uh, then we went down to the beach and, um, first it was just going to be her. And then the more he listened, the husband, he said, you know what? I think I need to be doing the same thing uh, and recommit my life as well. And so we walked out into the uh, perfect waters of the Gulf of Mexico uh, yesterday and, uh, and baptized them both into Christ. And then we were standing around praying. It was kind of funny watching all the beach people watching us because it's not something you see every day <laughs> when people are frolicking uh, in the surf that all of a sudden we're going to be out there watching people commit but you know we were walking out together everybody was dripping wet and there was a bunch of people that were sitting there along the place we were walking out and i was getting the thumbs up like way to go you know you guys are doing the right thing so i thought it was pretty awesome to show you that you know by putting yourself out there is how you impact people and you're willing to talk about how the gospel impacted your life and then you share that with other people. So yep. that was a really neat uh, a day for us. Lisa and I loved it. And, of course, they were just like, man, thank you all for taking the time. We're like, well, this is what we do. It's what the podcast is about. It's what each of us does. And so we're just – you don't have to have a church to be a living example of what the kingdom of God does. And this was all happening on a Sunday. And it, we weren't in a church setting. We were at my house and then out on the beach. So, you know, you grow where you're planted and you do what you're called to do, whatever context that you're in. So it was a neat experience for us uh, to get a chance to do that. So what's an illustration of the church is the people and not anything to do with the steeple. <laughs> Remember that, Phil? <laughs> yeah. The finger, you ever seen that? They do their the interlocking, fingers. The interlocking fingers and they put the steeple and that's not biblical. Yeah, you know, I mean, it sort of is, but 
Well, if, we, if you'd have gone north from where you had your baptism, yep. you'd have got to us up here. We were doing the same thing. And I assured them that we would be, I'd baptize them where there are no alligators. It's inside the building <laughs> without gators nor cotton mouths. Now, if you want to go good. south and we'll go down there where I live, well, you you look you look out for the gators and look out for the cotton mouths. So this is the safest place. And when my case, Dad, I was looking out for the sharks, you know, I guess, because I was yeah. out in the Gulf, you know, yeah. but I didn't see any sharks, although we yeah. did get nibbled by some of the whitefish mm -hmm. out there. So you're right. It's the same thing happening in two different locations at That's roughly right. the same time, yep. um, which was all kingdom work. You know, it's interesting, Dad. On the last podcast, I was going to ask you about this. You, you, we were talking about y'all killing some teal, and we, you talked about the reptiles, the cotton mouths that are mentioned in Acts chapter ten that came down in that sheet, which means, of course, that they are, according to the Almighty, you can eat that now if you want to. I, I don't know that you'd <laughs> want to, but it was included in the sheet. But I saw a picture I wanted to ask you about because I guess from one day you were hunting this week, Phyllis is holding up a cotton mouth. A dead cotton mouth that was it in the blind with y'all? What was the story about? It was that? in the I blind the whole time they hunted. I was not in the blind because I had to drive up there to preach the gospel. It was Memphis. Sunday morning. Oh, okay. But, uh, but Al, upon further review, which is the danger of taking pictures, you know, you've seen the commercials where if we could just come up with a way to stop life and rewind. <laughs> It would solve a lot of problems in marriage, you know. I told you, you know, no, you, I told you, no, well, you call a timeout, rewind, watch what happened, and then you, upon further review. But have you, have you seen the commercials that are doing that now? Have you seen any of those commercials? No, but I heard about them. Those are the ones I was yeah. referring to. I don't watch TV. Right. But what I was going to say is. <laughs> but Jace, heard, you're I on heard, TV. I, I heard this story too. <laughs> I mean, so it was a near death experience and you know, we could have died. So so Burley and Phyllis and whoever else was in the blind, they were sitting in the blind with a poisonous snake on Sunday morning, which should tell you something right there. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> so they tell us this chilling story, you know, about how they survived to tell about it. Well, I saw the picture and Jay sent it to me, you know, boy, you were lucky you weren't here. You know, you lived to tell about it. And I oh, said, Oh no, I know what you're going to well, say. Cause one, I didn't check this picture out closely. So I sent the text, you know, he's telling me about Facebook and people starting, you know, prayer groups and thanking the Lord for this salvation that they weren't harmed. And it was not a cotton mouth. So, I saw that, but they were having so much fun with it. Well, <laughs> they all didn't want to break the tension, but I had to be that guy. And uh, now look, you know, I, looked, I saw, I'm him, glad right, I I saw him right off. Fish snake. We call them fish snakes. And I mean, I hate to tell you this, but no non-poisonous snakes were harmed during that, except the one they thought was a poisonous snake. <laughs> so they made a mistake. Which goes in perfectly with where we're at about the narrow gate, because they yep. they went wide gate on what they thought was a poisonous snake, and so they're all you know having this near death experience, and and it's providing clarity to their life, and they've moved to a deeper relationship with God over this near death experience, but it was not. Yeah, uh, it snake. was all <laughs> the fish snake looks. He favors. Yeah. A cotton mouth, but if you look at the color, you'll notice that uh, it's much lighter on him. He's well, uh, Phil, I saw it in two seconds. I thought, yeah. well, this is a great story. I did too, but I just said, it's you know, I'm not so the story. I, I'm so glad I brought it up because here's the way I saw it. So Lisa's sitting in the living room, and she says she holds her phone up and says, look at this. Well, I'm looking across the room, and I can see Phyllis. And I can see her holding a snake, but but I wasn't looking at it closely like you guys were. And so I thought, oh, man. I said, what does it say? And it says, 
I was sitting next to this poison snake all morning and mm-hmm. could have easily been killed. And so yeah. I was thinking, man, I, I don't yeah. know about that. Yeah, it's that, a that, great that's... story. It just wasn't true. It was a misidentification <laughs> of a snake. And so the next time I see them, we'll have fun with that. Because now they've opened themselves up to what I'm going to plan. The next time I have Burley and Phyllis in the blind, I'm going to bring my own rubber snake. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's happening. Because I'm going to say sometimes you have to have something drastic really happen for you to learn the identification of species. Yep. So they've they've left themselves open to that. Don't get me wrong. There have been times when we have killed cotton mouths. Oh, many blind. times. Many, many times. times. Oh, yeah. But it, it's a better story if it really was a cotton mouth. Yeah. <laughs> I it mean, is, it was really- perfect segue, you know, Jesus said, I am the truth. You know, the one right. in, in the log that you were up, up, up Cypress Creek up there, you ran into one close. Oh, no, that was yeah. the real deal there. So if you have, if you're looking at a snake and it opens its mouth and there's a white flash, that's the sign to start shooting. Make a move. You're way too close because that, that's what they do. A cottonmouth, he'll do that. It's a warning. He's saying, I will hurt you. So I'm I a little surprised. At the time we had three on three different logs, we're floating on them. The blinds are on the logs, but three different cottonmouths were in one, two, three. And I looked down and we were hunting. I said, everybody lean over the front of the blind here and let's kill these snakes out before yeah. we get bitten. So, uh, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. We got all three of them. I mean, I just wanted to, I mean, they don't, they're not aware of this, Al. I'm just now revealing this. So they, but I just, at some point I need to have a conversation with her before she starts her new show, I Survived the Experience <laughs> with the Snake, whatever. They have all these shows, you know, I Survived. You need to tell Phyllis, we don't her to, want her to become the new Psy where you're yeah. just making stuff up, you know, telling stories. There so, needs to be some. I hate that snake. I saw the life. snake outside the. Someone had thrown him out there behind the blind, and I walked over to him this morning, and turned him over, just to make sure. I said, "But it's what I thought it was." But they were yeah. having so much fun with it, so I just decided. To no, I mean, I hate, I hate it happened, but it was just collateral damage and mistaken identity. So. And now you're going to work on that. So yeah, I've been bitten twice by in my youth by fish snakes, we used to have a little fish trap down there that held the bait fish for trot lines in the summertime. And those fish snakes would get in there. But I, I was bitten two different times, Bob, and it hurts, number one, when you get bit. Of course, you don't swell up or anything because it's not poisonous, but they're very mean and aggressive snakes, especially when you're trying to take them away from your fish. So that happened to me when I was a kid twice. But, you know, I, I, I first thought first time I thought I was on my way to the hospital and you said, no, nope, fish snake. You looked at it and you went down there and picked up the thing and it had this the snake in there. Dad, and you said, nope, fish snake, you're good. Now get down there and finish up what I told you. Oh, <laughs> I mean, no, I was, I, look, I was I, traumatized because I got bit. <laughs> I, oh, no, I, I saw a TV uh, animal wrangler that from Hollywood get fired over this same thing, which. You know, no one was injured that bad, but uh, they were trying to do some. This was early days of uh, Duck Dynasty. And so here's the professional. He handed Willie a chicken snake, and they were going to have some kind of picture or something. Well, that thing just turned around and just bit Willie immediately. And blood was pouring down his arm. I mean, just pouring. And so the snake wrangler was like, he's not, you're not in danger. You're not. In, and Willie was, I could tell what Willie was thinking. Blood is pouring down my arm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what danger you had in mind. And that's when I looked at him. Sharp teeth. And I, no, no, no poison. And I saw, yeah. I know it's no poison in the snake. They didn't injure the snake or whatever. They let him go. But Willie was hot. <laughs> And so I looked at the guy's hands, and I noticed that he only had nine fingers. And I said, how did you lose that finger? And he said, well, it was a snake bite. And I said, well, 
my dad told me, which you didn't tell me this, but I just, off the top of my head, I said it. Never trust a nine-fingered snake wrangler. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Guy. I never I saw him again. They, he was <laughs> he fired, go. and we he made go. from that moment that we were not going to do any kind of specialty shots involving animals. We're just going to be yeah. who we are. I, that was literally like day two of filming. That ended yeah, that. that. Yeah, that was true story. I'm sure the statute of limitations ran out. I guess whatever. (laughs) So um, you know, our kind of our family motto, I guess, has has always been faith, family, and ducks, and uh, that's kind of what we're known for. And you know, that doesn't happen by accident, Jace. You have to you have to teach principles and values uh, to your kids, and then your kids teach them to their kids. And now we're into uh, four generations for dad. And mom, and so part of that is being able to shape um, your family, and and that's done a lot of times through books. And so our good friends at Brave Books uh, believe in the power of the family unit to shape the next generation. You have some there. In fact, you know one of the authors quite well, Jace. I I do know her, and this is not a biography on why she married me. You know, Brave Books, <laughs> but uh, it's a family oriented kids book. That's awesome. I've read it probably a hundred times to various kids in our family. So she did good. And the whole series is great. A lot of great authors, a lot of great ideas, very creative. Uh, It's part of the Braves book club. And when you join this, you're going to get a new book delivered every month that teaches a faith-based value, such as sanctity of life, discernment, perseverance. Uh, These books come with corresponding family activities and lessons that your family can use as a theme throughout your home all month long. So it's really great. Uh, Teaches true traditional values, cultivates great family habits, fosters intentional family time, which we all need. Let Brave Books help you because they've got it figured out. Go to bravebooks.com right now. Use the code unashamed for 20% off your Brave Books family subscription. That's bravebooks.com slash unashamed for 20% off your subscription. That's pretty good. Never trust. There's a T-shirt for you. Never trust a nine-figured snake wrangler. I was really when what? he said a snake bit me. I was shocked. I thought, and this is what you do. <laughs> nope. <laughs> One strike was, and you're out in my book. I don't even want to hear the story. He said, "Well, I want to tell you the story," and I said, "I don't want to hear it." <laughs> it was like the the Aussie that we all loved that. You know, mess with the snakes. Remember old Steve Irwin? And then finally, uh, I think it was a no, it was a, a stingray. stingray. Yeah, and no, I mean it a was st- it was an accident, but it was tragic. Yeah, but you, I mean, what I'm saying is, he loved messing yeah. with dangerous things, and they finally got him. I mean, it's I almost like yeah. it's inevitable. I mean, animals can be dangerous, especially when you get them in that kind of setting. And uh, you know, I hate to tell what? a morbid story about we don't shoot non venomous snakes, but. You know, when it's before daylight and you're sitting beside a snake that looks a lot like a cottonmouth, look, things happen, you know. And so. No, I remember the first time I saw, we were playing baseball down on a little baseball field uh, in front of the house when we were kids. And I went down to get the ball. Somebody had hit it down by the river and I saw the back end of a copperhead. So I started kind of backing up and looking for something to kill the copperhead with because, you know, it was just right there at me. He's pausing this. Oh, yeah. And I followed him halfway up, and then halfway up the copperhead, there's a king snake that's eating the copperhead. So, I, so awesome. you know, halfway, you imagine you're watching the end of this thing, and then you see the king snake goes from there. And I was like, huh, because, you know, up until that point, I didn't know a lot of difference. I thought, one thing's for sure, the king snake is on our side. That's correct. Because he's, he's eating the poisonous snakes. Well, it's a tough conversation to have because a lot of people, they don't want any kind of, you know, a- animal to ever be killed or, you know, and, and I get it. But when you live where we live, it is a survival thing, and especially when you have kids and, and animals. They overstep their bounds. And when they're trying to live in your house, well, you know, you just got to take them out. I mean, which our duck blinds are our houses. So go find somewhere else to live. But 
<laughs> trust well, trust me, well, we've yeah. been after cotton mouths, and it seems like to me there's more every year than there was last year. So I don't think we we're got a dinner. We got sixteen hundred acres there. Surely we can coexist, just not not in the same space, which is good. So, Jace, like you said, I guess it's a perfect lead in uh, to what we were talking about on the last podcast because we were talking about the narrow door, which kind of came on the heels of the context of the mustard seed and the yeast. And I didn't mention this before, uh, but this is going to come up again in chapter 14, is also this text back in Luke 13, 10, um, started with Jesus healing a crippled woman in the Sabbath. And of course there's a lot of blowback from that because there's this guy there saying, you got six days a week. You can come to be healed. Don't, don't come in here on the Sabbath expecting to be healed because he had this whole misinterpretation on what the Sabbath was and who it was made for. But that's going to come up again. We get to this idea in, in Luke 14. So I wanted to mention that, but last time on the podcast, we were talking about, uh, Luke thirteen twenty two through 30. And in that, Jay, uh, Jay's talked about this idea about the narrow door really being an expansion. Not It's not as restricting as you might think. It's restricting only in that if you don't choose Jesus, you don't get through the door. And I mentioned John chapter 10, verse 9, where Jesus said, I am the gate. Therefore, I am the pathway to salvation. And, and the apostles say the same thing in Acts 4, 12. So he's actually painting a picture where it's a narrow door, but the expansion of the kingdom is much bigger uh, when you look at the possibilities of it. And so when we get to this, where we're going to be talking about today in Luke 13, 31, you're going to see this played out in his view of Jerusalem because he's getting nearer the city. And so he gets warned about Herod, which dad read last time. And then he's going to respond to this in a really unique and interesting way about Jerusalem. And I think you could say that his response applies not just to one city, but also the sort of bigger idea of Judaism. So let me let me read this, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. So this is right after he says in verse 30, Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. And so I think that's a reference to Judaism and now this extension into these new people that are going to be coming into the kingdom feast. And then in verse 31, at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go to somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. So he's getting closer to Jerusalem, which of course is where Herod, um, you know, is, is, has his palace. And so it's kind of interesting because the first question before I read the rest of it is, are these Pharisees that are really sensitive to Jesus or is this a ploy to try? Because I read a lot of scholars that, you know, I saw both sides of it. Or are they just trying to get get rid of him, get him out of Jerusalem? What do you yeah, think? I think is it was it? a ploy. That's kind of what I think, too. A lot yeah. of them were saying, oh, yeah, they were really Pharisees that were for him. But we don't really see that, except for Nicodemus. We're not seeing a lot of pro-Jesus Pharisees in any of the four gospel accounts. No, I, I, I agree 100%. Yeah. And I just think Jesus' response when he says, you know, go tell that fox, yeah. which is a strange thing for Jesus to say. You know, tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal, mm. which is another thing you get into. Scholars are like, what did he mean? What was he saying? But it just seems to be another reference of his whole his whole ministry coming down yeah. to what's going to happen in those three days. I mean, he, I think so. he shows the character of God. He alludes to his death. He alludes to the resurrection, but it being fin finished. Now, I am in the minority of that. You know, most scholars, they don't think that third day he was talking about the resurrection. But Oh, I think it, I think it definitely was. And I think it shows you again, and this has been happening in almost every story he tells, he's jumping time, past, present, and future, as if he was at one time outside of time, which he was. 
So I think he's most definitely given them that little three day. You know, he's he's talking about it here in a broader context because obviously he's saying I'm gonna drive out demons and heal people. Well, that's in the context of where he is in the moment. So that's not limited to three days. But what he's saying is, if you want to look at this as a three-day period, I'm going to do exactly what I've been sent to do. And Herod, that fox, um, you know, he's not going to be able to stop me from doing what I've been called to do. Well, before you read the last section, I, I do think you got to just remember, if you didn't hear the last podcast, I recommend you listen to it because this is kind of a continuation but the reason the gate is narrow is because Jesus is unlike any other religious figure that's ever claimed to be a religious figure, or even they didn't and became one. That's right. In that he's basically saying, I'm not giving you what you need to do. I- I'm going to do this for you. It- it- this is a person that is going to do this for you. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And and he goes on to say a lot of other I am's. You know, I am the resurrection. I'm the gate. I'm the bread of life. And so all other religious leaders, they're not claiming to be God, and they're giving you the instructions, the rules, on how you accomplish this. And so you know that, so there's two things at work. You have Jesus setting himself up as God, which is very different. He's he's setting himself up as the way to be successful is to become weak, to love the unlovable, to, in his case, to die. Well, n- n- nobody else is saying that everybody else is wanting to storm the hill, take the, uh, what do they call us, uh, take the imposters, and and it's all based on your performance. And, and then at the same time, when you look at all the ways he answered the question, how do you enter the kingdom? It, it's a list of things that you would never list in any other religion. You remember where he said, unless you become like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom. He says, it's very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. says that numerous times. And so all of a sudden, that's making the door seem kind of narrow. It's like you got to become like a child. You, you got to, if you got a lot of money, it's going to be real hard, you know, to enter it. Then that we, we mentioned in the overtime last time when he told Nicodemus, he's like, you know, how do I, how do I get in this thing? He's like, well, you got to be born again. Well, he's telling a religious leader you got to be born again uh you remember the rich guy when he said go sell everything you have or even the graphic illustration when he said uh it's better for you it's like if your eye causes you to sin it'd be better to have one eye when you enter the kingdom than have both of them to all these pictures you're seeing humility you're seeing the importance of it and it's the lack of rules to get into it is also in contrast to every other religious group. You know, most people, you say, well, how do I enter this thing? Well, they're going to give you a list. Well, Jesus seems to be giving you answers to those questions that have this humility in common, have this idea of you need to be open-minded about who I am. You need to look at me, trust me in, in this. You remember the, uh, Thomas and John 14, which caused this radical statement when he's like, well, how do we know the way? Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And they're like, well, how do we know? You know, how do we get there? That, that was their question. It was the same as it. How do we get, enter this? And he's like, I am the way. And so that's the narrowness of it. So, so by definition, Jesus is saying, I am the way in any other way is no way. Plus, he's the only one that's ever appeared that's like him. Exactly. Well, then you get into his character, you get into his claims, and you get into what he actually accomplished. So just think about it. If you're going to build a kingdom that can never be destroyed, 
well, you're going to have to do something about death. Well, what 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 did he do? You have this, to get this, hooked up with the right individual. <laughs> so it comes back to that. I always go back to that. You know why Jesus is our high priest. And usually, when you think of priests, you think of religious groups and and people who have set them exalted themselves above the other people, saying we're the we're the bridge, we're the priest, because that's what a priest is. We're we're the we're the person in between you and God. You bring me your sins. I'll take them to the Father, and I'll let you know how it works out. But in that Hebrews passage, I think it's Hebrews chapter 7, when it says Jesus became our high priest not on the basis of a regulation, which is basically what people want to know. If you want to enter college, you got to go meet with somebody, fill out some forms, and they're going to tell you exactly what you got to do to enter. They're not going to say, okay, you're going to have to become like a little child. And and by the way, so you need to be born again. So you see that? That's why I gave you the, the little child. And you need to go sell everything you have. Well, your first question is, well, how am I going to pay for it? Well, how am I going to learn if I'm acting like a child? It, it's not making any sense what he's saying in a worldly, physical world. And so I think that needs to be addressed because most people take these passages and they say, look, here are the things you have to believe and here's the way you got to live your life or you're not going to enter it. That's why it's so narrow. That's what most religious people, when I hear them speak about this, because they're like, look, you put A your- lot of them won't even bring up the new birth. No. They'll say, you put your faith and trust in God and then you try your best to be perfect. And you might make it. That That's how they're looking at this, because they're interjecting their own righteousness, which is another phrase Jesus used. You remember when he said, unless your right- righteousness surpasses the Pharisees and the scribes, you'll never enter the kingdom. Well, just think about that statement. You're looking at religious leaders who have devoted their lives and whose lives are good, I mean, compared to most people. And you're like, my righteousness has to surpass that? Well, how can I do that? Well, the answer is you're not going to be able to do it on your own works. The only righteousness that would surpass it would be God's righteousness. And now we're back to Jesus. Well, how many sins did he commit? None. That's why he said, I'm the way. I'm going to do this. I'm going to show you how to live. I'm going to give my life for your sins, not my own, because he didn't have any. I'm going to destroy death itself. So when you then realize that you humble yourselves, you go all in for Jesus, you enter his kingdom, he gives you his power, his spirit, well, you're then indestructible. And it happens like organically, one at one at a time. And you become a part of the greatest kingdom the world has ever known. The same one Daniel was talking about. And so then people say, well, but I don't feel that. I don't sense that. But we know it will finally be completed when he comes back. Then we're made like him from the physical realm of being imperishable, from perishable to imperishable. You get into 1 Corinthians 15. I mean, that's what he's describing. Well, where else are you going to find that door in life? It doesn't exist. Well, now we see why broad is the road that leads to destruction. It, you know, anything other than that doesn't even answer the problems that you would have to have to be a part of an eternal kingdom. No, Jace, you're right. And I think that when you apply this idea of the narrow to your ability to be able to be righteous, even in the if you do that in today's times, you're doing exactly what the people are doing back then, which is what he was telling them not to do, to put it on your own righteousness. It has to the only way you're righteous is to serve a righteous, perfect savior and to be protected by his sacrifice. So uh, it was, it's, it's really curious uh, when he says Herod wants to kill you, it, it's almost like for the first time, Jesus is almost offended by this comment because it's like here he is talking about kingdom and king and you bring in the current guy 
And so I think that's why he responds so strongly to this concept that somehow Herod is in control of Jesus' whole situation. Because you're right, Jace. He, he, I've never seen him like go, go directly, especially in a political realm, after the guy. He calls him a fox, which is interesting because we know what a fox is, right? We kind of think of it as just kind of a sly uh, you know, animal that really just goes in and takes innocent chickens or whatever. I mean, like the, the things that can't defend themselves against him. And so not necessarily negative or positive, but that's how we see a fox. But I did a little bit of digging. The Jewish view was they would say that a fox was sly. They would say a fox was destructive, but they really emphasized that a fox was insignificant and which is interesting. So I think Jesus kind of making the application of all three of those to Herod because Herod is not as strong as he thinks he is because he, you know, he's left Israel open to be, you know, taken over by the Romans anyway. So, I mean, how, how strong is Herod really in the big scheme of things? So I think that may be one of the reasons why he calls him a fox. But I also know that late, later in the text, he uses chicken and her chicks gather them together in the same context. He's talking about the people there talking about a fox. So no matter how you look at it, it's not a positive picture or a metaphor or image of Herod to call him this fox. So let me read the rest of it. Then we'll, we'll finish talking about it. So he says, go tell that fox. I'll drive out demons, heal people today and tomorrow. Third day, I'll reach my goal, which I agree, Jace. I think he's talking about his sacrifice and his resurrection. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Now that's a huge negative connotation for what's been done in Jerusalem over the course of Judaism to prophets. And then he comes back and says in verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So now he puts it back on the people, but he does put it in a context of this chicken, you know, trying to gather the, the her chicks. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, I mean, obviously this is a bit of a, a dirge, I would say, a, a bit of a sadness that Jesus has when he thinks about Jerusalem and what's going to happen to her. And he just sees this rejection, even though he's come to save her, that she's not going to accept what he's come to do as, as a whole, as the people. And he doesn't blame that on Herod. He puts that back on the folks. In 70, 70 AD comes along and... Yeah. Down comes yeah. the temple. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. That's why this is important to read because a lot of people, when you're, we're going to get into some, some difficult prophecies about what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And, you know, religious people today just always apply it to when what I was talking to earlier, when Jesus comes back and the kingdom is then made imperishable with, you know, our bodies. They, they, they don't even, look at what Jesus kept saying about what's going to happen to Judaism and Jerusalem itself, which sure. they were putting all their eggs in that basket. And I do think that's there's a hint of that you see in his response to Herod, you know, calling him a fox, because kings are always, it, it's like a, uh, you know, a game of power. You, you, you're, manipulating, you're scheming, there's back room, That's and right. they'll, and at the end of the day, all those people, I mean, you even see it in our politics and governments today, and I mean, I hate to tell you this, but most politicians and people in authority, their number one goal is to maintain their own power. Yep. Now, we going to fix everything and do all this, They'll say all that. They're not going to say that's their number one thing, but that is their number one thing. It's just the harsh reality of earthly power and kingdom. You remember the uh, the Shakespeare play or whatever when the the king was 
being hunted and he, they were fighting and I don't remember, I'm not a big William Shakespeare, but I remember this line. And the king said, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Because in the moment, he's like, you can have my whole kingdom, but I need to get out of here. Because <laughs> he, <laughs> in his nature, self-survival was the number one thing. And it's really the, the corrupt part of earthly power. And it, it's the lie. Uh, even in the, you know, we read this before in Daniel 5, what the writing on the wall happened. You know, the, the city's surrounded, they're fixed to be destroyed, and they're all drinking wine out of gold goblets, just acting like it ain't going to happen. Yep. And the, the writing on the wall came up and said, it's over. <laughs> you know, and the, and the king was dead before daybreak. It's a harsh reality of that, but that's why when Jesus, the the way he came, was so hard for you to wrap your head around, which is why he's talking about narrow doors. And it just doesn't seem like this is the way you're going to conquer the world. I hadn't thought about it, but until you just brought that up, but you know, Herod, one of the reasons why Jesus was so sharp about him is remember he, this is the same guy who had John the Baptist beheaded. And you remember over what? Over a lascivious dance of, you know, his wife's daughter. And then he makes a prideful boast and says, I'll give you half my kingdom. Talk about it. You're talking about giving away the store in the moment all over a dance, you know, like he's at a strip club. And yeah, he's going to get like that Shakespeare play, you know. Yeah, half it was. My kingdom, I mean, half my kingdom for that dance, you know. For that dance, and then she says, "No, I don't want half your kingdom, but I will take the head of John the Baptist." Yeah. Which was it? He was shocked that she went there, but when you're corrupt, you shouldn't be shocked that other corrupt people will out corrupt your corrupt. How many? How many people who run for office or are in office in these United States of America? How many of them are, are followers of Jesus Christ? Well, that would be hard to ascertain, but I'll... Not, probably I'll, not many, Dad. I'll give you the politically correct answer in the context of what we're discussing. I would say that door is pretty narrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You think? <laughs> well, I think it goes in perfectly with what we're saying. Because I do think this, too, the Pharisees, the reason I think I said this I don't know if it was earlier or in the last podcast. The reason I think this was a plot and the Pharisees weren't being totally honest is because most of the times when you threaten someone with, with something that's real, you got to remember this same Herod killed his cousin, like Al just said, and Jesus is doing things that they consider to be threatening, that he has their attention. Yeah. And there are various people are looking for ways to kill him. And don't ever doubt it. If someone in power in most countries with this kind of power, the king or the president, if they put their scope on you and they're after you, you're probably going down. Yeah, I mean, it. just start looking at who controls the Justice Department and the law. So most people, when they hear this, would panic. I mean, because you'd say, you know, this is all a great ministry until people start dying, yep. and which is exactly what happened. Even though Jesus told them over and over and over and over again, this is going to happen. Well, when it became real, wh where did, where did all his followers go? They ran it. And that's why you make threats like this. Cause they thought, yeah, we want him out of here. And this is the way to do let Let's, let's see him squirm here. And, Unfortunately for them, they didn't know that Jesus' plan trumped death itself, which, which is, right. you know, when you think about why we, you know, we try to vote for people who are godly and, and we're so appreciative of our, you know, soldiers that gave our life, gave their life so that we can vote and have freedom. But there's a simple verse in Hebrews 2 that really puts things in perspective on why Jesus was here. And we've read it multiple times, but you know, Hebrews two, 
the whole fact why Jesus became a man in verse 14, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And that's why that accusation came out there. Herod's out to kill you. Well, what are they, what are they going on? They're going on the basic human nature of fear of death that the evil one controls. That's the way to control people. Yep. And if the evil one, I mean, he's been a murderer from the beginning. That was his way to keep his kingdoms in order. If someone's a threat, you kill him. And that's why the scheme of redemption is so awesome, how God's plan worked. He took the very thing that the evil one used and those in power used to control kingdoms, which is death. I mean, you know, how did kingdoms take over other kingdoms back, to, back in the day? They invaded them and they killed them. You either become a member of our kingdom or you die. That There's no, it, it's two roads. Yep. And so I think that's why he's using these analogies because they work in a kingdom setting. You're like, oh, but Jesus took the very thing that they used as their power and turned it on its head. Because when they killed him, it saved humanity gave them a way to be, have their sins removed. And then it gave him the ability through the power of the Spirit to destroy death itself. Well, now you can create a people who are clean, holy, God-like because of his mercy and grace, and they're God-like in that you can't kill them. Even though you kill them, they won't die. And even if they do die, they're coming back. So they're, in essence, not dead. You can't take my life if I've already fully given it to the kingdom of God, I mean, it's a, it, I have now given my life, both my physical and my spiritual life, over to the kingdom of God where I live eternally. I mean, I'm just in the interim waiting period. So you come in and say, well, we're going to kill you. You're just like, well, you can kill my body, but you won't stop me. And yeah. you won't stop my influence and you won't stop me ultimately because we're all going to come back and you won't be part of that. So you're right. Yeah. It's it's an indestructible army. Is what now, look, is. Al, I mean, I hate to bring this up because this is morbid and it was probably a little scary the first time it happened. But I had three times in my life where I've shared Jesus with someone and their response was, I'm fixed to kill you. They, they threatened my life. Only once did I think it was serious. You know, I thought, because I was doing, I was in a prison ministry. I was in prison. I was behind bars. There's no guard. And I have about 20 guys and I'm up there sharing Jesus. And they kept trying to talk. And I said, whatever you're going to say, it's not working. You're in prison, locked up on earth. So listen, I want you to listen. And it made a guy so mad that he got up and he was said, I'm fixed to kill you with my bare hands. But I just shared what I just got through sharing. And I said, well, go ahead and kill me. But I will guarantee you this, I will be back. <laughs> but even that <laughs> statement in all three times kind of surprised them. I was like, yeah, I, I'm not, it's not, my life is not yours to take. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. I can make you imperishable. You're you, that that's the way you operate. You immediately go to, well, I'll take you out because you're threatening me. You know, of course, I was threatening him in a good way to look into his heart and see that what you're doing is not working. What what else do you need to I mean, put you're this in together? prison, locked up? Society has locked you up and you're trying to give me your take on religion. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. It's not working. We've locked you up. You are a danger to society, yourself and others. I'm trying to free you and give it, you know, give you a way out here. You can start over. I mean, all the right thing. But his response was, I'm not going to hear it, and I'll take you out. I'll threaten you. Yep. So, I mean, it happened in real life. It was only three times. But it, you really see the nature of the earthly kingdom versus the heavenly kingdom in those kind of discussions. Yeah, I had a similar one in Africa when the guy just jumped up on stage and 
I mean, literally was just a foot away from me, and I didn't know if he was armed or not. And he had a crazy look in his eyes. I don't know if he was insane, possessed, or just maybe on something. But he started in on me, and I could barely understand what he was saying. But I, but in that moment, it was funny, Jace, because inside I was kind of churning, you know, and I kind of looked around like, is anybody going to do anything? Because I'm, I'm, I'm literally speaking to hundreds of people. And I just looked at him and said, sir, you need to go sit down under that tree. I'm trying to present the gospel to these people here, and you're interrupting me. You go sit under that tree, and when I'm finished, I'll come talk to you. And he looked at me, and he just hopped down off the stage and walked over there and sat under a tree. And I just went right back to doing my thing. And you think, well, how do you get a moment of of boldness like that, which could have been, I'm in another country. I have no rights here. How do you do that? Because in that moment, you have the power of God in you. It's just like you just dealt with it. And look, when it was over, I went over with two or three other brothers and sat down and talked to him. And he was something was wrong with him. But I'm saying just to Jason's point as well, when you feel like you're indestructible for the cause of the kingdom of God, you have a boldness and strength that you can do anything. All right. So we're out of time. Um, but in overtime, I wanted to talk a little bit about this last quote. Because that's from Psalm 118, so I want to mention that, uh, and also the significance of the three days too. So we'll talk a little bit about, a little bit more about that if you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed is where you can fire our overtime. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes, and don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else. Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.